Hello, and welcome to Elantum Digital's Publishing by the Numbers, where we help authors and self-publishers create quality books and build successful self-publishing businesses. Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Publishing by the Numbers podcast. I'm Jana S. Brown, um, and, and I've been thinking about it. We should actually add some of our background as to what it is that we do. Because we talked about it in our first episode, but that was a long time ago. So I'm Jan S. Brown. I, I'm an author, an editor, a author coach, and all, all, all around bookworm. And I am here with my two fabulous co hosts, with CJ and Naya. What do you Hello. do, CJ? Hello. How are you doing? Am I telling? Am I, am yes, I saying you are. what I Okay. Say, so. say what you are. Hey, what I am. Okay. I'm an author, editor, coach, uh, book formatter, complete and total geek which I think is criteria for anything in the book industry. Uh, so, hey, guys. Hi. And Virginia Anderson. And I'm, oh, what am I? I am, uh, I think I have some sort of obsessive compulsive uh, disorder that needs to be diagnosed <laughs> properly. Uh, that was the revelation I had last night. But other than that, I love books. I We do a lot of coaching and I'm obsessed with everything that's really, related to the self-publishing industry. Fantastic. And we are here on podcast number nine. This is our introduction to professional editing. So last week we talked about the realm of self-editing and self-editing being all of the work that you as the author or potentially yourself and a VA or a ghostwriter do to get a manuscript all bright and as shiny as you can before you turn it over to the hands of a professional. So this should be kind of fun. There is a lot of information that we could go into here. So this is not the only show we will do on editing. We will, in fact, do a show this week and next week on editing, and we will revisit it thereafter. But we thought this was kind of a good time to start defining some terms, put put some foundation under it for something that is going to come up fairly frequently. So uh, I think maybe first thing first, what is professional editing? Take it away, Jana. Oh. Oh, gosh, I was about to say go CJ. So <laughs> professional editing is when you are now going to work with an, somebody who has some editing experience and generally editing background. And it's a really kind of a funky term simply because there are a bunch of schools out there that do teach editing classes that even have editing degrees. But that doesn't mean that every editor that is a professional editor actually has that schooling. There, there isn't a you know grand certificate that says I'm an editor. Anybody who wants to can hang out their shingle. But when we're talking about professional editing, we are talking about somebody with that background and those skills to go through your manuscript. And they're going to take what you made shiny and they are really going to polish and hone it. And they are going to help you to have the very best product possible to send out into the world so that your readers are not going to be confused. And a good editor is going to help you make your project even more of what you want. Would you add to that? No, I think that was perfect. Other than just stating, make sure that you know that editors are specialized or should be specialized in certain things. If you if you look for editors who say they can do everything, I might call that into question, although there are some who can. But, you know, again, a, a professional editor hopefully knows a ton about a specific type of editing. Um, that way they can give you the best uh editing performance, I guess you could say, or round of edits that you can get from them. So we talk about uh, self-editing in a previous episode. And the reason why we said that it's a good idea to do self-editing is because you want to uh, save time and some money in um, providing something that you're already kind of happy getting there and then you get the professional to do another round uh, which is what I do I do self-editing definitely and then I'm going to pass it on to my uh, professional editor to get them to edit that book so the other thing that's really important to remember is your you as the writer your ideally you are not also the professional editor of your own book it's, um, I've tried, this is not something that you can improvise. 
it takes years of training. It takes a very specialized set of skills to do so. So uh, if you, I mean, by all means, do the self-editing, but then pass it on to a professional. Um, why do we, why do we do, why do we need it? Why do we actually, why can't I just stop at self-editing and then so be it? Uh, just from my own personal experience, even though I am very well versed in the writing process, I tend to be blind to my own weaknesses. I tend to be blind to my own screw ups. And I do have those thoughts in my head where I know instinctively that there is some weak areas in the manuscript, but it's going to take work to fix. And so sometimes I just think, oh, I'm sure that's fine. Uh, and then once I get it to my editor, inevitably what happens is I get that extra pair of eyes on there to validate what I already know because of what I've already been trained to do, which is that characters is that character is a little weak. This goal is a little weak. The conflict is a little weak, or maybe there's a plot hole, or maybe there's just some inconsistency or something that is not quite right. And so where, where there may be low tension, uh, where there may be some pacing issues. Um, sometimes I can pick that up, but a lot of the time I don't want to fix it, or I might not even know how to, because I'm so in my head about it and I don't want to mess anything up. And then other times it's like, it's hard to kill your darlings. Okay. You are attached and married to what you did. And so you need someone else to look at it and say, okay, sweetie, honey, pumpkin, mm. <laughs> Let's revisit. <laughs> okay. And, and usually, hopefully you have an editor who will get to know your tics and also know how to handle you and how to approach that. And so for me, it's my, my editor's just like, Hey, you, you know, better it's this, this, and this. And I'm like, ah, all right. And then I go back and do it. You know, I stamp my foot, I throw a tantrum and then I go do it because she's right. Always. Um, so that's kind of why you need it. No matter how good of an author you are, no matter how much experience you have writing, you are going to miss things. You are going to be blinded by things and you're going to be blinded by what you are attached to. Uh, so even if it's not working, you'll still be attached to it and you go, oh, I want it to work fit, fit, fit. And, and it won't, and you need someone to tell you to stop that and to fix it. Uh, so that's, that's, that's why I get an editor. So. The next time you use any of those words, oh, honey, pumpkin, darling, sweetheart, <laughs> I know that you're going to break some news that I do not want to hear. But <laughs> it's to hear. like the mm, pumpkin. <laughs> um, but, then, well, and it's true. You, you just get to the point in your own writing, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore. Right. Um, and, and I've seen that where... As an editor on somebody else's manuscript, I could see something very clearly. And this is particularly in commas. And, and if my writing partner is, and editor is listening to me, she'll laugh her butt off. Because when she's looking at my stuff, she brings with her what she calls the comma box. Because <laughs> I under comma things. I, I, I just don't get enough of them in there. And she will go through and sprinkle many more commas into my sentences. And suddenly they make a lot more sense and they read much better. And I can do that really, really well looking at somebody else's writing. But when it's my own, the only way I could do that is if I set it aside for a good month to six weeks, then I might be able to come back and look at it and get some of that structure back in, especially the grammatical stuff. But like you say, that depth, you really need somebody who isn't in your own head who can look at it and say, what you wrote was good. If you add more depth to it here, it will be better. If you can speed up the pacing, it will be better. And when I compare what was my really good manuscript with all my own self-editing to what happened after my editor, this is a better manuscript. And, and it sells better. I get better reader response. And that's really what you want, is that the biggest reason for doing it is that you want the readers to get your vision clearly. Um, authoring is the coolest thing because it's one of the few places where people invite us to take mind control of them. And we put little, I, I love it because it's little black, black marks on a page. And with those little black marks on a page, we take somebody somewhere else. We take control of their minds and we fill them with education or we take them on a trip. And now, now they're running through the Israeli sands with a, you know, sniper and all these other kind of cool things. And for a while, they're completely in your control. 
and I don't want them to leave my control. And so a (laughs) well-edited manuscript never tosses them out of the story until the last page. And then I want them to say, that was amazing. Give me another one. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want a well-edited manuscript, because that's the response I get from my best edited manuscripts is, where is the next one? I must go buy the second one in the series. What do you mean the third one isn't finished yet? Give me, give me, give me. That's why I want a well-edited manuscript. That's why I use a professional editor. And I want to just add to that. um, It is so important that you don't take it personally because it's never meant personally. It's not something you should dread. It's not a critical slight on you. Okay. (laughs) Virginie's over there grabbing her heart like, oh, but it is personal. Um, It is It is all about taking the good that you have and elevating it to another incredible level because more minds, more eyes, more thoughts on your project is beneficial. Whether you take all of the advice, which you probably won't, or whether you take the most beneficial parts of that and implement and fix it. It took me a little bit to get used to this idea of sharing my, my writing in a writing critique group. I was terrified. I didn't want other eyes on it. I didn't want other editors on it. I didn't want anyone to tell me what was wrong because I internalized it on a personal level in the beginning. I didn't know how else to separate my identity from the writing itself. And so I want you guys to understand that once you can get past that, then you really crave the criticism because you know it's going to be constructive. You know that each piece of criticism is going to teach you something really important that you can then utilize the next time you write and you just get better and better and better. So if you can look at editing as an opportunity to progress and grow, not just make the manuscript better, but make your own writing better because you're learning from your editor. It's so beneficial. That it's yet another reason that you should hire a professional because what they can teach you and help you understand and implement moving forward makes you a better writer as you continue on. And, and I mean, for me, that's priceless. So that's just another thing to consider. Uh, and this is kind of join the, 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 make the point to my next question is there are software out there that you can use, right? But right. there's no software. And we talk about that in the during the mm-hmm. self editing session. There's no software that ha- can have that kind of human understanding of the subtleties in the language. And it and again, as I said, it's really great because a lot of things can be replaced by machines these days. This is not one of those. So um, there is soft software, and we talk about that. We make mention of those. Uh, if you look at the show notes, we it's all in there. But I'm I'm just not going to talk more about software. Okay, let's dive in a little bit more into uh, editing. So there are different type of editing. Can we just go like really briefly because we're going to dive into those different types and more in details in another on another episode? But can we just uh, in a few words, what is a developmental editing? Developmental editing is real big picture stuff. Okay, Um, it's something that I do a much better. job at I'm I, it's harder for me to get granular and to see the commas the way that Janet can see the commas or or any of those smaller things so it's big picture stuff um in fiction we're looking for plot improvements structural analysis um dialogue description um basically the way you structure and plot your book and if anything throws us out or if there's any inconsistencies involved so analyzing plot and structure that has a lot to do with with uh, developmental edit so big picture stuff yep it'll also sometimes help with logical checks especially in nonfiction, to make sure you know does this a make logical sense and b you can sometimes have a developmental editor who will help you to make sure that your facts are correct and that actually does cross over to fiction sometimes because there's as much as fiction is the suspense of disbelief you still have to have things right and if you're running around and you're putting the safety on your glock the glock doesn't have a safety and, and a good developmental editor is going to help you catch things like that and go, no, 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 that kind of firearm doesn't have a safety. We either have to change these lines and remove that, or we have to make, we have to switch you to a different gun. 
and so those are some of the things developmental editor will hopefully help you pick up is mm -hmm. can this really happen if you if you uh, shoot a tire does it really explode it does not by the way um <laughs> I, I did that for one of my clients where he, he had this whole scene where he shot the, they shot the tire and you know it exploded and threw the van around and this that and then I'm like is the tire made of explodium what why <laughs> would this really happen and so yeah. I went down a rabbit hole and I admit I, I I did this and it wasn't totally necessary but it was fun um where I looked up YouTube videos of shooting tires, spinning tires with various types of weapons, and we found out, you know, what was actually correct and made the scene correct. Now, sometimes for dramatic license, you may still have the tire explode, but your developmental editor is going to let you know this is what's real and this is what's not. Make sure that you lampshade it appropriately if you're going to do the thing that isn't realistic. Uh, and when you write that uh, historical fiction. Mm -hmm. This is really important. Has yeah. to be right. Yeah, has to be right. Otherwise, it's just it 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 doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work. Yeah, and your uh, reviewers will nail you for it. Your readers will get you for it every time. So yeah, and so that's why. So we're going to go through this different type of uh, editors, but um, that's why some when you hire someone, you got to ask what they're specializing in. Um, and that's what that joins with, you know, what CJ said, you know, if they said they can do everything, uh, it's probably not a good thing. So, uh, what's a line editor? Well, line editing is looking at the way that sentences and paragraphs are structured. Very often you won't hire somebody who is specifically a line editor. This very often gets pulled up either into developmental or down into copy. But we do like to talk about it separately because it is a very specific skill. So they'll look at a paragraph and say, you know, you've used the word awkward three times in this paragraph and it makes it read strangely. I suggest that you rephrase this or you've got a sentence that goes on for two paragraphs and while it might be grammatically correct, it's really hard to understand. So the line editing is the paragraph and line level to make sure that there's clarity, to make sure that there's consistency. And okay. so let's just carry on with uh, copy editing. With that copy is your grammatical editing. nerds. Yeah, it's it's all it's very granular. Like that is that is smaller stuff right there. Um, it's not something that I excel at. I can do it, but I make no guarantees. So that's not really something that I ever do for anybody. <laughs> um, but it's more uh, punctuation, spelling, grammar, inconsistencies, and error in language, homophones. Um, what was the other one that starts with an H, Jana? I always try to say it and I get it tripped up. Not homophones, but um, there's homonyms and homophones homonyms. Uh -huh. yes. and, and hyphens, <laughs> one more H word for you. Uh, and yeah. uh, all of that details. My very, very favorite copy editor, and her, her name is Jenny Stevens. Hi, Jenny. Um, <laughs> once told me as your copy editor i don't read your stories i just look at your words and that's what a good copy editor does they're not going to look at that big story stuff but they're going to analyze every word its placement in the sentence is it the correct word is it you know are there supposed to be accent marks they get down into that granular detail and they make sure that your words are very very pretty and much much better than just a spell checker which you know it might tell you it's spelled incorrectly but whether or not it's going to give you the right new spelling who knows and proofreading let's just finish on i want to thing. clear up a little bit on proofreading a lot of people get proofreading and copy edits a little bit mixed up and i i guess you could say that proofreading is copy editing but what it really means is it's proofing the the proof i guess you could <laughs> you could say you're proofreading the formatted books. So they're not, it's not just a redo or a look at grammatical stuff. It's also a look at the margins. Once your book has been formatted, the interior has been designed and laid out into ebook and paperback. What you're looking at is, are the chapters there? Are the titles there? Are the page numbers how they should be? Um, so it is a little bit of redoing or reviewing what the copy editor is doing, but also at the formatting stage. Um, so that's the difference there. Um, because sometimes it, there, there are things that will get, uh, I mean, they really, there are going to be things that the copy editor will not catch because we are not perfect and it will happen. There will be a few typos or a few things or a miscom or something like that. And so this is just another pass for that, but also just to make sure that the interior looks the way it needs to look. Okay. By the way, you will always find something. You, you will. 
so we talk about uh, what two, uh, four type of editing. Even if you hire four different people to go through your manuscript, you will still find some things that just miss, you know, not everyone missed it. So, and that's okay. That's the difference between being offering something for quality and being too perfectionist. What, what I always said that people who are being perfectionist, they are just procrastinators. So if you think I'm going to be quite tough here, if you think that you're being a perfectionist, I would challenge you and say, are you being a perfectionist? Or are you just procrastinating? Because I and Jenna knows that, and CJ also knows that, I have this children book and we're talking about 1500 words, not many words. How many times did I go review that, that book? Too many times, too Never. many times. How many to people read where, It was like two in the morning one time for you. I don't know why I was up that late, but I was like, why are you still doing this? <laughs> I think uh, one, two, three, four people you, and with me, five people have gone through those 1500 words and I'm still not letting it go. By the way, I'm almost getting there. I, I know I say that every time, but I feel like yeah. this, this, this time is for real. Press the button, Frank, you have to publish, you know, and, and that is a really good point. Yes, that, that's one of my favorite things. Press the button, Frank. Um, that That's a really great point because it really is easy that your fear is, well, if I publish it, it's going to go out into the world and people might criticize me and I don't know how it's going to be received. And so instead, I'll sit here and I'll obsess over it. And whether it's 1,500 words or 150,000 words, people do this. And you need to be able to say at a certain point, you're going to let it out. It doesn't matter that it's not perfect. It matters that it's as good as you can make this book because there are lessons that you cannot learn until you move on to the next book. And your 15th book is going to be better than your first and your 50th is going to be better than your 15th. And that's all about progress. All the great authors I know are continually learning. They're continually getting better at their craft. They're continually um, reaching out to their market. And so to be a great author, you got to put out more than one book. You, and, and to do that, you got to be able to let it go. And, and on the whole typo thing, I'm going to bring come back to this for just a second. This also happens in traditional publishing. So because we talk to people who are doing you know, all sorts of things, even though we, we do have leanings towards self-publishing traditional, it, it is important. There are places it fulfills. And the thing is, you will not get away from typos that get out into print even if you are traditionally published, because they too are human. Things get out there. Um, the last thing I heard was that if you had 10 errors in a 100,000 word book, you had had an excellent editing staff. So that's the other thing is do not come down on your editors if you find one typo in your book. It's going to happen. Keep a list of it. And if you're self-publishing, fortunately, you can just go in and fix it. And it's not a big deal, but it, it happens. And I mean, I have a book here and I love this book because there's a whole folio, which is eight pages, where every time the letters P and I are together, it got changed into the mathematical pi symbol. <laughs> and so here, here it is, all these books. And this is traditionally published. So they <laughs> ran at least 10,000 of these things before some eagle-eyed reader caught it and went... Did you know that in all of these pages here, every time that P and I are together, it's now the mathematical pi symbol? And the poor authors, because they complain to the authors first, and the authors are like, what, what are we supposed to do about it? There's 10,000 plus copies of this out there. So they, they did a really good job with saying, well, now it's a collector's edition. But <laughs> know that that happens. No, no matter small press, large press, self-published, you're not going to catch everything, and that's okay. But we want to catch most of it. We want it to be very, very easy to read. That's the whole point. Your language should not get in the way of your readers enjoying your story or learning whatever they're learning from a nonfiction book. So this is a, a good point uh, because we talk about those different type of editing. Uh, I mean, if money was not an object, then I'll hire like, you know, all the all all of different type. But if I, you know, budget is limited, what, which one should I hire, and how can I prioritize? Um, yeah. So if I can only choose one, what do I do? Oh, uh, I think that it's really going to depend on where your manuscript is at. 
Um, if you, I do know that there are authors that will do kind of bundles. So if you can only do it one way, I would encourage the line slash copy edit method. <laughs> I would put those two together if I can, because even a line editor still blurs the lines between um, developmental edits and line edits. They can still look at big picture stuff and they can identify problems that you can fix. And then they're still going to help you with the granular stuff. Um, so I think if you can, if you can kind of find someone who can do some of that, that would be beneficial. So uh, what I like to do for clients, if they want to do, um, a mix of, well, I don't do copy edits, but if they want to do a mix of development and line, then I will do two passes and I'll give them a discount. So they're, you know, they're only paying for just a tiny bit more. They're not paying the same amount they would for a developmental edit and then a line edit. I'm putting those two together and then I'm discounting that, uh, to try to help them save money but also because it's good for me to go and do two passes as long as they know that I'll need time in between those passes to not look at their manuscript. <laughs> They'll need to fix anything I told them to fix and give me some time to, to, to have some space from that so I can go back and look at it with fresh eyes. If you have an editor tell you that they can do all of that within a couple of days, run away, run away, because that I don't know any editor who is, is capable of seeing everything when they haven't been able to see it with fresh eyes or haven't been able to rest like that. I, I would be concerned about that. Um, now, as far as rates go, you could try your hand at finding a freelancer who's brand new. Maybe it's not that they don't have the expertise. They do, but they're trying to build a name for themselves. So they have to charge lower. Uh, but that's usually the only time that I see those prices any lower because you don't want to you don't want to go with an editor who has no experience. You do want to go with an editor who knows what they're doing. Um, and sometimes that will cost you a little bit more. Now, as far as proofreading goes, you could have anybody do that. You could have beta readers, you know, and even some copy editing, you can have beta readers do because there is always going to be someone who joins your newsletter or or your review team when you get to that point you're building these things who just loves to read books and they're an English major and they know how to look at all of this material and they'll email you after they've read your book and reviewed it and they will say hey I found this 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 and it's like awesome thank you so much you know um mm -hmm. so there there are ways to get around having to pay for like all of those extra eyes um Jana what are your thoughts on that um, I agree that the line in copy is the most important thing to get someone who absolutely knows what they're doing. Um, with developmental, a good developmental editor is an amazing gift. However, if you have a good group, of a good critique group or a good beta group, you really can figure out a lot of the developmental stuff yourself. Um, and with the proofreading, like you say, my mother is my proofreader sometimes, and I pay her by taking her beloved grandchild down and we hang out at her house and help her do stuff. And this is my exchange for that. And then I have a cousin and she will do proofreading in exchange for big chunks of fudge at Christmas time. So oh, there, there's perfect. a lot you can do with that where you do you do an exchange. Um, other authors can be really good with developmental because since they do understand story. So in that case, a lot of times you can swap manuscripts where you're going to look at theirs and look for those structural things. They're going to look at yours and the same thing. So you can accomplish a lot of that. But somebody who knows all of the grammar inside and out and correct usage and things like that, that is so hard to find without going to somebody who loves it and who has all of the right resources, who knows when to use the Chicago Manual of Style and which dictionary they're going to rely on, which uh, structural stylistic stuff you're going to do. All of that is so granular that that's where I really feel like you, you really need a professional there and pay their rates. And then with the others, that there is some flexibility. Okay, so... Okay, let's go really fast here because um, I, you know, you guys cannot do concise as I can. I can see, you know, you're just talking. <laughs> what, whatever. The two of us together are talking less than you do on one question. <laughs> okay, where can I find the editors? Um, um, Upwork. Yep. Fiverr. Writing no, groups. Although no, I don't know Fiverr. that I would look for anyone don't, on Fiverr. Yeah. Don't, don't send them to Fiverr. 
Fiber um, is a great resource, guys, but it's not as good for editing and for writing. I found great map makers there. I've seen some great cover artists. There's a lot of things that are great on Fiber. I think you get better writers and editors on Upwork or Readsy. Readsy is expensive, but yeah. they're really, really good. If, if, if you need something to be really, really good, um, they, they work with, you know, big names and stuff generally higher off of Readsy. Um, not just big names. I use uh, editor on Readsy and she was- and We thought you were a big name. Uh, oh. That's right. <laughs> I mean, like, what, what obviously, happened, what happened to <laughs> feed the vanity, uh, Jana? Just what, throw what gasoline on that fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, because you already spent all that time to get that manuscript up there, this is just the last bit. Like, don't do things halfway. Otherwise, you know, my motto is always either you do it 100% or don't do it. Don't bother. So, uh, this is so, so important. So I think it's, don't look at it, at, I mean, I don't look at it as an expense. I really look at it as an investment. The, you know, the quality of the, my book is the foundation of my business. So, so I'm willing to go on Ritzy and pay uh, more the editors because I know they are really great. Uh, and the editors I use, she was really great. So uh, Ritzy is definitely a great place. Um, Somewhere else? Um, there are Facebook groups that, especially some of the big author groups, you've heard us talk about these before, uh, 20 Books to 50K, The Writing Gals, Wide for the Win. They gather so many people that are involved in publishing in one place, and all of them have threads. Now, don't just go on there and, and post for an editor because that becomes really confusing. But they all have threads that you can look up that will be people who offer services. Or sometimes they'll have like a, today is the day to ask people for things. What do you need? So, you know, those are good groups to be part of anyway, just for the information that you can learn and for connecting with other authors. But they're also great places to find editors. And then you can Google Foo. Google for an editor near you, and that's where you run into, um, like I worked with Eschler Editing at one time. They're a local one here in Utah, and they're amazing. The Manuscript Doctor is really good. Sage and Salt is good. So there's also agencies there that if you go and you Google and you say, um, I, I'm looking for an editing company uh, with these kind of things, you're going to find those, and you'll find individual freelancers that way too. And so you can kind of look through and see what's going to suit what it is that you need. Also, ask your friends, you know, did you have an amazing editor? Who are they? Um, did you love them? That's actually a really great way to do it because you can find out, you know, some things about the quality of the editor by talking to their clients. Um, okay, the next big question, how much do I have to pay? A million dollars. Oh, wait. <laughs> Dr. Evil. I found his name. It's Dr. Evil. Virginia talked about that once with the cat stroking and everything. It's Dr. Evil. Oh, so, that's right. And, and he says a million dollars. Um, <laughs> that would evil. be nice, but yeah. that is that is not it. All one right, go my, CJ. Uh, one of my many uh, role models. Um, usually with development and line editing, uh, I've seen anywhere from two cents to six cents per word. Um I usually charged three or still do charge three cents per word for development and line edits. Copy edits can be like one to two cents. Um, sometimes it can get up there a little bit higher. Um, proofreading, usually half a cent to one cent, although I, uh, it really just depends. It depends on the freelancer, the experience, the expertise. Um, and really also the level of cleanup that they have to do, uh, because sometimes they instead of charging per word, they will charge hourly, which I don't recommend. Try try to avoid hiring someone who is going to charge you hourly. There's really no way to measure that uh, as far as how much they're getting done. Uh, it's much better to do it per word. Um, but yeah, do you have any other things to add there, Jana, with the prices or you, Virginie? Yeah. Um, I'm going to see a range. They, I've seen developmental as low as uh, 008 to one cents a word. Again, usually oh. with, um, well, but again, that's usually with new editors oh, as yeah. they're just breaking in. Because mm -hmm. if you, when you're just out of college, you need somebody to give you a shot. And, and I'll tell you, I've got people who gave me some of my first editing jobs and they still get their editing for a, a wing and a prayer because mm -hmm. they gave me my first 
my first jobs and help me build my portfolio. So right. I still give them really, really great rates. So yeah, you're going to see those, but you will see people in that lower one. Again, you just want to make sure that they've got the background, that they're not just somebody who said, well, gosh, I like to read books. I think I will be an editor today. Because mm -hmm. that's not going to give you the background that you need for it to be worth that payment. And so that's kind of the things you're looking at is how experienced is this person? Are they portfolio building? Or is it somebody who just on a whim decided I'll be an editor today? Uh, so one place I forgot to look for hiring editors is on Elantum Digital. We have, we have. Editing. Oh, yeah, that place. You know that place? That place? We have editing. We're sending everyone away from Elantum Digital. We're like, you want to try this place? Wait, don't we do editing? <laughs> well, we do, but. We do editing. Uh, so um, we're just uh, putting up a like different packages. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So one of the things that we're going to offer and uh, is um, a doing a editorial assessment. So we're taking like a. A, a snapshot about 10,000 words from different chapters of your book and we're going to do a review and we're going to uh, issue a report on what kind of editing is needed um, uh, how much work it's going to be needed and we're, we're going to give you some recommendations of what we can do for you and this is why also please do the self-editing beforehand because if your manuscript is just all over I think um, we are we are fortunate enough to be in a place where we can refuse work so uh, we we want to work with clients who are proud of their work um, not just okay here is a pile of words deal with it. This is not how we do things. So um, if, you're if you're proud of your work, we'll do everything we can to help you and we will we'll see it from your manuscript. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, not at all. That's not what I'm saying, but it's really, do you value what you're, what you're giving to us? It will be available very, very soon on our website. But in the meantime, if that's something that you're interested, send us an email to info at uh, elantumdigital.com and we'll, uh, we, can, we can, you know, we can do this way manually rather than just, you know, automatically on the website, but it will be up on the uh, website very, very, very soon. So, okay. Uh, Actually, that that uh, leads into something else. When you're working with editors, whether it's us or somebody else, very often editors will offer a sample edit, which will either be um, for just a little bit of money or sometimes they're free. It, it depends on the editor. If you can get a sample, go for it. Because one of the things that even a three to 5,000 word sample edit is going to tell you is it's going to tell you a lot about the editor's style and their personality and whether or not that meshes with what you need. Because for instance, I, I think I'm funny. And so sometimes I will add editorial comments coming from the thing of, I think I'm funny. And on rare occasion, I have run into somebody whose personality does not think that I'm funny, and they think that I am being offensive. And I would never, ever want to do that to a client. I don't want to be offensive. But it comes from a place of, you know, things like if I find a character that to me feels like, well, here's the character who keeps swooping in to save the day, even though they've got no skills, um, then I might call, you know, super character strikes again. And I love putting in comments like that. And I mean for it to be funny, mm -hmm. but I, you need to know that that's the way that I edit and to know whether you're going to find that as funny and, in, and informative or whether to you that's going to be uh, offensive or it's going to hurt your feelings or be something you can't work with. Because I don't want you to get a whole bunch of edits and come back and say, I hate these edits and I hate you because you're not funny. So that sample can sometimes help you to see this is the personality that I'm dealing with. And when it works well, it's so beautiful. You, you want to really hire an editor and see if you can't stay with the same editor for a very, very long time because they will learn your style. You will learn theirs. Edits will get faster. They'll become more precise. You will continually crank out better books, but you want it to be the right match, not just any match. So samples can sometimes really help that. How long does it take? 
just a roughly. Oh, well, uh, if, we're, if we're measuring in hours, um, you, uh, an editor, depending on how much work you're dealing with, whether it's just in bad shape as far as the manuscript goes, is just in bad shape or not, um, it can be anywhere from five to 10 pages. If it's in really good shape, maybe a little bit more than 10 pages an hour. But it's I've I've seen and and I have seen for me and for other authors that that's the average depending on on better or worse as far as the manuscript manuscripts quality is you're looking at between five to ten pages an hour. Yeah, Jenna, that's your yep. for you. Uh, approximately that, and how long it's going to be in weeks is going to depend on the editor and how busy their schedule is, because right. a lot of us will be signing contracts for you know the next slot but I'm not starting your manuscript when I sign the contract because I'm finishing something else and then you take the next slot. So maybe heads down working only on that thing, it's a two week project, but the contract I may sign with you gives me 30 days because that 30 days allows for finishing my last thing and going right into yours because as a freelancer, I, I want to keep my board filled. I don't want it to be, okay, now I finished yours and now I'm looking for somebody to do for, for the next job. So lots of freelancers will stack it that way, where the heads down time might only be two weeks, but they say 30 days. The other thing that allows for is that life happens. Um, and, and everybody has to kind of know their own thing and say, yeah, I'm giving myself a little bit of fudge room because the holidays are coming up, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that there are days that I am not going to work on anything because I will be busy baking. Um, and so if I have a contract that's going through December, that's going to be a real open thing to say, yeah, this is a much longer contract than what I would usually do because we are accounting for the holidays. So communication is a big thing. If you need a job as a rush, you need to tell your, your potential editor that ahead of time so they can see whether or not they can put you in the schedule and also expect that a rush job where it's yours is going to be the only thing they work on it's a really tightened schedule you're going to pay more for, for that I have a rush uh, addition that is here's my per word and if you you want you need it in a rush at the same time there's an additional cost to that uh what do I look for in a good editor so just Let's go back. There's a different type of editors. You have to know first what kind of editors you're looking for. And on that basis, what are the, some of the things I need to uh, check to make sure that I have a good editor who is going to work on my manuscript? CJ? I, I think Jana touched on that um, with the samples. Um, you're assessing whether or not you're getting good communication, good feedback, valuable feedback. If I um, am asking for line and copy edits and I get a sample edit and they've made three changes, I know myself and I know that there are more than three changes that need to be made. OK, so if if they do nothing, hardly anything, or if they over edit to the extent that my author voice is gone and they kind of miss the mark on some things, I'm going to pay attention to that as well, because there are some edits that are necessary, but there are also some edits that really aren't. And so I need to pay attention, you know, are they changing the meaning of what I'm saying um, for no reason at all, just because they they liked this word change better, you know? Uh, so there, there are some things that you can look at as far as that goes. Um, it is important if, especially on, on uh, you know, if you were to go to Upwork, you can see on their profile um, the, the jobs that they've had. You can see the reviews that are left. You can um, see what their clients have said. Uh, and you can pay attention to whether they actually finish these jobs. And if they get very good ratings, that's always a good sign that there's, you know, probably someone that is experienced and uh, attention detailed or um, pay attention to those details. And then again, it's always back to communication because like Jana said, we're not always going to be your cup of tea. We could be excellent editors, but if we're our personalities are not meshing well with yours, if we just don't get you and you just don't get our style of editing, then that's something you need to know right away. And that's why that sample edit and also just this opportunity to assess your manuscript and tell you what we think, you know, that's going to help you guys decide if we're a good fit as well on, on both ends. So uh, those are my thoughts on that. What do you think, Jana? I would just add to that. Those were really, really great. So add to it their communication style. 
So, so talk to people. Don't, don't just hire somebody. Talk to them first. Find out how do they work? What's their communication style? What can you expect from them? And you can ask them questions like, what references do you use? If somebody cannot come back and tell you this is the dictionary that I go to for spellings and hyphenations, they're probably not going to be a very good editor for you because they should know the basics that it's either Merriam-Webster or it's Oxford most of the time. And, and why they would use that. The Chicago Manual of Style is the style guide for fiction. If they don't know what the Chicago Manual of Style or the CMOS is, then they're probably not an experienced fiction editor. You know, there, there's things like that. They should know what Strunk and White is. If you're looking in nonfiction, they should know style guides like MLA and APA and be able to tell you this is how we would set up your bibliography and all those kinds of things. And if they can't tell you any of that background detail, then they haven't been at this for very long or they're they're more of a surface editor. And that might be a great person for proofreading, but I wouldn't pay them three to six cents for everything else. So so delve into it a little bit and find out some of those those things. Can can they answer your questions about editing? And also, do they have any clients that would be willing to talk to you and say this person was amazing? Because if they can't find even one client who's willing to write them a testimonial or to speak to you and say that they're good, that's always fishy waters for me. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Next week, we're going to talk to Corey Roop, who is a professional editor, and we'll talk talk touch on to some things like, you know, kind of what is the day in the life of an editor, all those kinds of things. And it'll be fun to get her uh, viewpoint. It's nice when we can bring in people that aren't just us to give you something entirely different. Um, so we'll be doing that. Look forward to that. And we are now to my very favorite part of the show. Virginie, tell us something entirely irrelevant that you have to share with us this week. So I have many irrelevant things to share, but I thought that's worth of mentioning. Um, you know that I live in Australia, right? So you have those stereotypes of, you know, the Australian surfer, the beautiful landscape, nature, and all that. But what they don't necessarily advertise is that we have probably the deadliest animals and insect on land and in the sea on the, you know, on the whole planet. So <laughs> I have this phobia, you know, like of snakes or anything that is a little bit like the kind of slow moving kind of slithering thing. And my, and, and it's a real phobia. It's really like, it's real. So if I see one, I would start crying. And I cannot see one on my phone, in a magazine, in a book. I, it happened. And I have last time through my phone far, far away from me until my husband comes back home to rescue me because he has to take my phone, use my thumbnail to unlock the phone <laughs> without me looking, remove <laughs> that page with the snake on it so that I can actually use my phone. My... My daughter has no issues with that. And uh, I didn't know that was a thing that pythons, apparently it's not a pet. So mm -hmm. my, my neighbors, they have two young boys. They have a, pi a, 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 a pet python. Oh dear. Has, yes. Oh, I'm firmly against this. I am against this. I'm no pet pythons, no. So no, no, right? It's not a pet. It's it's not a pet. Like for those of you who are listening, like if you tell me it's a pet, like we're we're not going to work well together. You got to be on this. <laughs> I feel like I need to be, you know, vindicated. And I, I I I I yes, this is I have palpitations right now just thinking about it. So my daughter <laughs> wants to touch this thing, and she's like, Do you want should we get a, a baby python? They're so cute. And then I'm like, you think they're cute? <laughs> At night, when you're lying in your bed and you think that the python is all cuddly and lying next to you, let me tell you, my darling daughter, they're not <laughs> trying to be cuddly. They're just measuring up to see how big you are so that they can have enough space to strangle you and then swallow you whole. 
Did you tell her this? <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I had to get out of big gun because I cannot. I cannot. I mean, I completely agree with you, but man, that must have been an eye-opening combo for you and and, and your daughter. But, but then, you know, she's, she's this is obviously not her hot truth because she just look at me and like, no, they won't. <laughs> she's like, you are, you've lived longer, but I'm sure you're wrong. Yeah. That's how she felt about that. She, yeah. So that was my irrelevant and very, very scary moment. So what about you, Jenna? Oh, my irrelevant moment is that it has started snowing here. And I am really grateful for the snow. And at the same time, I look out my window and I go, well, crap, there's a bunch of fall stuff that we didn't get done. And here is the snow gently falling through the air to land on the tomato plants that I have not yet pulled out of the garden. And the garden hose that is stretched across the lawn because somebody was supposed to roll it up and put it in the shed and didn't. So I, I am pondering how much snow we're going to get between now and Saturday and whether or not on Saturday we can deal with all of the rest of this. And mm. how much that's going to be we, and how much that's going to be my husband, and whether or not I'm going to find $20 to pay the little boy who lives a couple houses down to take care of all of it for me. And that is becoming more and more tempting. So what about you, CJ? What is irrelevant in your world this week? Oh, uh, okay. So Spike, our pug, I, I think I have shared a little bit about our pug and his struggles. Um he was neutered. Okay. And in the directions, they're like, your dog should be groggy and less painful. He won't run around. He's not going to want to do anything for a couple of days. This is normal. And I'm thinking, thank the Lord, because he is always into things. And I would love nothing more than to have this dog just stay in his cage and sleep. So we get home and this dog is not lying down, even though he shouldn't be moving at all. He's just as peppy as he was before, even though he's got several stitches in his lower abdomen. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, they said, they promised me, they promised me that he wouldn't move a muscle. And this dog is acting like he has never had surgery a day in his life. And he continued in that vein. And I had to forcibly put him in the cage just to keep him from ripping his stitches because he wanted to jump from couch to couch to to the table. He got on my table. And I was like, what did they give you? What? Because it's not what they should have given you. The pain meds they gave you. (laughs) This is not right. So that was unfortunate because I thought I'd have like a three day break. It was worse than ever before. They lied to me and I want my money back. That's all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, with that, thank you so much for joining us. You can find the show in the show notes at www.alantumdigital.com. And you can follow the podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast distributor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see y'all later. Bye. Bye.